Okay, it's a very warm welcome from a Sunday afternoon in Oxford today. My name is David Mills. I'm um, um, Vice Director of the Center for Global Higher Education, and um, it's a great pleasure to be hosting Jiahun Li from Ulster University today. Her topic is, is international education ethical and political enough? Rethinking the ethics and politics of international student mobility. And I think um, this is a really important topic and, and it's, I'm really pleased that we've got Jihan um, to come and talk to us about this. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, can you see my screen, right? The Perfect. slides. Yeah, really good. Okay, that's great. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, so today I'm going to talk about the ethics and politics of international student mobility which um, has received relatively little attention in academic and policy accounts and has often been overshadowed by economic concerns. That is the extraction of student fees through the recruitment and retention of international students. But first, I would like to start with the following quote, which critically points out the risk of viewing international student mobility as a neutral experience and international students as an autonomous mobile subject. Ideas about mobility consistently risk becoming locked into a historical and depoliticized tropes that presume flattened geographies, opportunities without borders, and autonomous, raceless, genderless mobile subjects. Such perspectives are problematic because various ethical and political issues of international student mobility can be made invisible. In this presentation, I'll first discuss what we know about the ethics and politics of international education and why a proposed institutional habitus as a useful conceptual framework to explore some of the ethical and political issues arising from international student mobility. This will then be followed by a short introduction of the empirical study that I conducted in the UK in 2018 and the discussion of findings. This presentation will end with the main contributions of this study and the implications for practice and research. To put simply, ethics is concerned with relationality or the denial of relationality, while politics is uh, politics refers to issues involving power or domination. Now, surprisingly, these two notions are closely intertwined. As Stain indicates, ethics are formulated situated and negotiated within and between particular social historical contexts, collectivities, subjectivities, and power relations. In other words, relationality or the denial of relationality inevitably entails the question of power. Discussions about the ethics and politics of international education are broadly underpinned by two perspectives, that is neoliberalism and post-colonialism. For instance, neoliberalism considers higher education as a profit-driven industry and international students as a source of profit. This has important ethical and political implications, such as conceptualizing international enrollment as a means to subsidize local students' education, and widening inequality in international students' home countries. Likewise, post-colonialism draws attention to the role of colonialism in Western higher education institutions' current dominance of educational internationalization and international student mobility. The post-colonial perspective can also be found in teaching and learning approaches for international students who are often constructed as subjects of deficit and are therefore responsible to adapt. In existing empirical work, ethical and political questions have been asked 
with, re with respect to the relationships between key actors involved in international education, such as mobile students, educational intermediaries like agents or brokers, education providers, communities, policymakers, and international governance bodies or mechanisms. Nevertheless, consideration of the ethical and political dimensions of international education so far remains implicit and relatively underexplored from an institutional perspective, that is, between higher education institutions and their international students. The UK provides a good case for exploring this issue due to a significant reduction in government funding the expansion of internationalization in UK higher education has been largely driven by income generation at both institutional and national levels. As Finney notes, international education and particularly the direct recruitment of international students serves as a means of financing the government's objective of opening higher education to a larger proportion of the UK population without increasing taxes. Like, many, like in many Western countries, international students' tuition fees un, are unregulated in the UK and tend to be considerably higher than those paid by local students. For instance, international students, especially those from non-EU countries, can pay up to three times the tuition fees of domestic students for the same course. The presence of international students is therefore justified on the ground that they make significant financial contributions to the UK through their tuition fees and other expenditure. Although whether international stu students should be charged differently, and treated by universities as cash cows is a recurring issue. Such criticisms are often countered with the logic of global supply and demand, as the following quote illustrates. In a job market that is increasingly globalized and where workers are increasingly mobile, having a degree from a reputable university in the UK can significantly improve a student's career prospects, particularly in Asia where a big chunk of international students come from. This explains in part why international students are willing to pay significantly more for a UK degree. However, in considering the ethics and politics of international student mobility, we should not easily make assumptions that international students are always the victims. As the following quote from my research highlight, Mobile students are equally accountable for and implicated in reproducing the uneven global higher education landscape. For instance, Nicole said, the UK degree is recognized everywhere. Everybody knows that. If you want to be qualified, you go through the UK system. People actually take you seriously. If you go to the US, it won't be the same. If you compare the US with the UK, it's just different there's just some seriousness in the UK education. Also, Emma also said, I just feel like I could just get a job anywhere. If you got a degree from the UK, that means a lot, especially in the Commonwealth. I think it's being looked at pretty positively. I think everywhere throughout the world, I don't think it's geographically limited. The degree from the UK is quite universally accepted, I suppose. As illustrated in these examples, many participants believe that a degree from the UK would be easily converted into job opportunities in various countries. However, this sense of being able to work in multiple countries is deeply rooted in academic imperialism, where a UK degree is portrayed as carrying significant cultural, economic, and emotional value. This is not surprising, given that about two thirds of the participants in this study came from countries, countries which used to be previous British colonies. So how can we then expose relations of power or domination at the institutional level? 
I propose the notion of institutional habitus as a useful conceptual framework to explore the ethical and political relationship between higher education institutions and their international students. Introduced by MACDO as organizational habitus in our work on students' college choice making in the USA, institutional habitus refers to the impact of a cultural group or social class on an individual's behavior through an intermediate organization. Ray and her colleagues elaborate this notion further in terms of educational status, organizational practices, and cultural and expressive characteristics to examine the influence of secondary schools on students' choice of higher education in the UK. Building on the existing body of research, institutional habitus is operationalized in this study as the university's position in global and national university rankings, the quality and quantity of career support, and the class and race of students and staff, as well as the place of institutions. Importantly, given that the institution is materialized by a range of collective as well as individual practices, it is possible for each student to develop individualized forms of both similar and differing yet interrelated habitus. Going beyond the focus of previous empirical studies on higher education choice making, I argue that institutional habitus plays an important role in shaping international students' experience during and after their studies in the UK. This research carried out in 2018 is based on case studies of international students studying at three universities in England. These universities were chosen to compare student responses according to various institutional positions in the field of higher education. For instance, Oxford and UCL are members of the Russell Group, which consists of 24 research intensive universities in the UK. However, Oxford is usually distinguished from UCL by forming a distinctive cluster together with Cambridge as the UK's two oldest universities. Brooks is one of 35 polytechniques which were granted full university status in 1992 and is a relatively new university than the other two institutions. Each case study involves qualitative semi-structure interviews with international students as well as career staff. In total, I interviewed 55 non-EU international students who were enrolled in or had recently completed postgraduate degrees. I focus on non-EU international students as they are different from EU students who had until Brexit the right to free movement within the EU countries and receive equal treatment with UK nationals in access to employment, working conditions, and all other social and tax advantages, including tuition fees, loans, grants, and visas. Additional interviews are conducted with three career staff in order to identify a variety of career advice and support available at each institution. This table shows some of the main characteristics on the interview sample with more or less equivalent splits between sites genders, enrolled degrees, study graduation status, and subjects of study. The participants were mainly recruited from the top 10 non-EU sending countries, identified from the 2016-17 Higher Education Statistics Agency student enrollment data. The findings, I will first present how the educational status organizational practices and cultural and expressive characteristics form the basis of the institutional habitus of the three case universities and influence the way in which they operate and characterize themselves. For instance, the narrative of Daisy and Edward illustrate how the markers of whiteness and certain class features were implicated in the cultural practices of Oxford. 
Daisy said, I don't think it's a complaint. I love Oxford University, but the tone, it's a bit too wide. Edward also said, so things like, so eating, in a, eating dinner in a formal hall, you'd be dressed up and you wear these weird gowns, you know, and it'll be a candlelit dinner. And during the matriculation, you start in your college and then you walk with your college mates to the Sheldonian Theatre and you enter. And the chancellor or vice chancellor speaks in Latin at you. All you're aware is you're becoming a student at the University of Oxford. They've been doing this matriculation ceremony for like, I don't know, a thousand years. It's like those little things that have gone through the generations. While lacking the dominance of one race or ethnicity over others and the cultural practices of a certain class as such, other aspects seem to be more prominent in the institutional habitus of UCL and Brooks. For instance, Naomi highlighted how UCL is perceived as a place inseparable from London. I just like the feeling that, you know, different streets in London are different parts of UCL. Similarly, Brooks features strongly in its program, professional accreditation and industry placement. Emma's narrative is illustrative of this. The course was accredited. The professional accreditation was one of the things that the university advertised the most, I think. Having flexible entry dates such as January and September and being located in the city of Oxford was also frequently pointed out by the participants from Brooks. In fact, the influence of institutional habitus goes beyond characterizing how each institution operates. I argue that it equally plays a significant role in shaping international students' experience during and after their studies. For instance, several participants at Oxford indicated that the collegiate structure of the university made it easier to interact with people from other academic disciplines and build social networks across the university. This is highlighted by Daisy. Oxford was like one life. Your study, your social activities, your friends are all in one bubble, beautiful bubble. Interestingly, being close to Oxford University was appealing to many participants from Brooks in terms of offering the opportunity to mingle and associate with elite social networks. Um, I've been surrounded by people that study in Oxford University, you know, if you socialize with their people, it'll encourage you to think similar with them. Sabrina believed that social exchange with Oxford students would enable her to accumulate and embody value cultural capital and dispositions, although she did not so far have a chance to interact with them since arrival in the UK. For participants at UCL, the distribution of learning spaces across London was not always received in a positive light. For example, finding a lecture room became part of a chaotic and disorganized routine for Ellen. In Hong Kong, we, we have to fix classrooms for a semester for the courses. But here at UCL, every week we change the venue for the new lecture. It is becoming an adventurous game. To join an adventurous game and find my classroom, Sometimes we have the lesson in mathematic buildings, sometimes in Russell Square, sometimes in Warren Street, sometimes like the main campus. I think that is one of the things that I didn't get used to it. The influence of institutional habitus is also evident in students' post-study aspirations and transitions. For example, Aaron indicated how the reputation and prestige of Oxford was translated into frequent and extensive exposure to different companies across various sectors during his studies. The university does give you a platform of attending different career fairs. So every term, at least three or four fairs happened. And then the different companies comes and come and they give their presentations. So there are a lot of different companies and you can see which one fits your profile. Because it's Oxford, a lot of companies prefer to come and present there. So yeah, it gives you a larger pool to choose from. 
Not only did this allow Aaron to imagine himself working in different countries after graduation, but this also led him to eventually land a job in another European country. For UCL participants, studying in London often contribute to broadening the positional possibilities. Take the example of Thomas. I feel like I'm part of history, so I live not far from here. And on my way to school, I get to see like a place where Charles Darwin used to live. I get to see all sorts of history as I'm walking by. I get to see where Virginia Woolf's statue is situated. I get to see all these amazing translators, people who've like changed how the world thinks. And that's why I'm here. It is to become somebody that makes a difference in the world. The visible presence of buildings and statues related to historical figures near the UCL campus influenced the way in which Thomas envisioned himself and his future. On the other hand, the perceived educational status of Brooks tends to limit rather than facilitate the abilities of participants to picture a wide range of possibilities after graduation. I think that's where Oxford Brookes University stood off from all of that. Basically, attending the university is not generally, it may not be an un advantage and all of that, but okay, let me give you an instance now. When I return, if I go back to my country and I go with an Oxford Brookes certificate, except someone who knows the school very well, I will just say I'm from Oxford. Not only did George evaluate academic worth of his university against criteria other than institutional prestige such as location, but his post-study plan was limited to home country, not in other places. It is important to note that different members of the university have a different relationship to the institution, with some participants distancing themselves from the institutional habitus of their university. This section, therefore, draws attention to how the institutional habitus is sometimes in line or conflict with students' dispositions and preferences, which can function as a source of pride or promise for them. A mismatch between individual and institutional habitus was especially noticeable amongst participants at Oxford. Such perception was evident in the narrative of Jasmine. I think it's quite elitist. It's very elitist because there's a lot of traditions. There's a lot of things happening. It's fun, it's very kind, it's very interesting, but it can also be very excluding to somebody who is not part of the upper or middle class. Also, there are not as many colored people, things like that. Jasmine underlined that a certain group of students might feel excluded by a lot of elitist traditions and social events at the university, as well as the composition of its student body, which is predominantly white. In contrast, the students from UCL and Brooks emphasize strongly the diverse backgrounds of students and staff although their perception of diversity within the institution differ greatly. The following two narratives are illustrative of this. Ellen said, 90% of students in my program is from mainland China. I think that is not really what I really think before I got here. I thought I can have a lot of foreign classmates and improve my English. But after all, I just improved my Mandarin. If you choose a course with a lot of Hong Kong people or a lot of Chinese people, then why did I come to the UK to study? In contrast, Katie said, the majority of the class was actually international students, which was nice. We learned from each other's experience and this gave us more exposure to global experience. I think it'll allow me to work anywhere I want to really. For Ellen, the diversity, or in this case, the lack of presence of native English speakers in her program prevented her from being exposed to valuable linguistic cultural capital that could have been converted into personal development opportunities. On the other hand, Katie indicated that the high proportion of international students in her program was definitely a positive thing. 
She believed that the exposure to diverse experience would open up various opportunities for her in the future. However, I argue that the crucial difference between students in terms of imagining future opportunities lies more in the interplay of institutional and personal resources. For instance, Sana relied on a student loan to support her studies in the UK and therefore had the pressure to pay back after graduation. Under such a circumstance, she could have operated with a narrow circumscribed space of choice. Instead, she was able to envision a wide range of possibilities across the countries. The university has some of the best professors in the field and the best opportunities in the industry. And this degree is accepted and valued all over the world. There is not a limitation. I think as far as the degree concerns, I'll have opportunities in the UK and Europe, US, China, India, everywhere, I think. Not only did substantial resources provided by the university help Sana to project her possibilities, but this perception was boosted further by her relatively young age and few relationship concerns. Take the example of Ellis. Despite having had successfully obtained two internships through departmental connections during her studies, the sense of being too old and the financial responsibility for her mom led her to return to her home country shortly after graduation. In Ellie's case, the institutional habitus was not directly translated into the positional possibilities upon graduation that other younger and more affluent participants at the university perceived and or experienced. In conclusion, I demonstrate the ethical and political limitations as well as possibilities of international student mobility through a focus on the relationship between higher education institutions and their international students. More specifically, this paper offers insights into the role of universities in shaping the experience of international students. Although this can be limited to a varying extent by individual social characteristics, Also, the notion of institutional habitus enables a detailed examination of the institutional context, which influence international students' experience during and after their studies, while drawing attention to, di to differences between these students within each institution. Overall, the awareness of the politics of international student mobility at the institutional level helps to denaturalize the construction of international students and their experience in the UK and brings to the fore the socially and spatially differentiated flow of international students in and through UK higher education. Last not but least, this study has important implications for practice and research. First, Policymakers should be more sensitized to the link between higher education institutions and their international students in terms of its implications for educational equity. Given that the proportion of international students relative to domestic students is increasing, particularly at postgraduate levels where non-UK students accounted for 56% of the total higher education population, Charging significantly higher fees for international students can not only affect how home students perceive international students and vice versa, but it may also undermine the ability to defend educational equality within national borders in the long term. Other higher education stakeholders need to facilitate discussions of inclusivity and social difference amongst international students and help universities to provide relevant resources catered to their needs, like the provision of financial hardship funds for international students during COVID-19. Higher education institutions also need to ensure that the gap between international students' expectations and their experiences overseas is as minimized as possible. This is particularly relevant to those studying in business or engineering 
engineering where the proportion of international students is usually higher than other disciplines. Future research should pay more attention to the social experience and relationships between key actors involved in international student mobility. Measuring them against ethical principles will have implications for the sustainability of international education, which, which should go beyond the matters of numbers. So these are the references. And if you are interested in learning more about my research, kindly refer to the following papers on which this presentation is based. Thanks very much for listening. Any questions or comments are welcome. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Johan. That was um, a, a, a really interesting um, analysis of, of university quite close to us, um, including, um, <laughs> including my own and the university here in, in Hellington, where I live, which is Brooks University. I thought your contrast with UCL was interesting, but of course, each of them slightly positions themselves differently um, with, with slightly different habituses, as you say, but but overall, they are, they are all, as you say, quite complicit in um, it, and reliant on a, a very large group of international students. So then the question probably comes around, to what extent do you think they're having debates about that? To what extent do you think that institutions like Oxford and Oxford Brooks are, are really thinking about their ethical responsibilities? Um, you know, there are many, many international scholarships here for students coming from all over the world. What does that do for um, research capacity in universities where they come from? Um, it, 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 you, you ask about the ethical and political implications. I guess my question is, do you think that they're even at that stage of having those debates yet? Well, I think those kind of debates are happening um, at the moment, which is, um, but I think quite limited to the extent um, like which they are valued like in economic terms. So mm -hmm. for instance, a lot of, um, like provision for like, a lot of like like equality provision for international students um are happening um like i don't know like for instance oxford brooks university some of the participants said um they have this pre-master program mm -hmm. um prior to their studies so they actually help these students um to develop academic skills and english um like abilities or something prior to their masters but um whereas the other two institutions don't don't really have that so i but i think i think these kind of debates are i think largely framed within this kind of um um the the, the war for um this kind of the you know focusing on student fees at least in the uk I think that's probably right. I think think you're right that where where there is debate, it's it's concern about the economics of of yeah. students. We seem to have lost the, the discussion around um, circulation and 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 what what happens when you um, make research careers possible and attractive through scholarships internationally. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. And, and, and my next question, but I would I would really welcome other people to to join in. Please just post any thoughts or reactions you have. Um, possibly drawing on your own experience as international students in the UK or elsewhere, or um, your, your research. So my, my, my other question then is, you, you're focusing on institutions. What about the funders? What about um, um, the, 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 the sort of scholarship funds and or the agents that are recruiting these students sometimes? Well, what ethical and political responsibilities do they have, do you think, the other intermediaries, the other brokers in this process? Um. I think, um, well, I think they they still, for instance, um, there's, um, I think they do shape um, the uh, the expectation of international students. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, agents or brokers they help students to, you know, get accepted by the universities, but they don't necessarily. Um, like share the information that students actually need. So for instance, um, they have certain expectation um, towards like studying in university A, but that that didn't really, once they arrived, that's actually not um, happening to them, you know. So 
yeah, I think so they they do have this kind of um um like responsibility like um in terms of shaping their expectations and like my study highlight a lot of like a couple of international students are largely disappointed by is disappointed in actual experience because they are facing lots of other like chinese or hong kong students in their programs so yeah i think yeah they do um play a role in shaping international students actual experience and outcomes Great, thank you. I mean, I think it's very interesting, and we saw some of the data in that um, webinar on Brexit, just how how robust international recruitment has been, despite despite the um, some of the publicity around um, student experiences, but also obviously the loss in, in EU students. L let's go. Let's go to some of our questions. Um, Brendan, um, you are first off the mark with a question. Do you want to um, unmute and ask a question, please? Sorry, but Brendan has um, actually said that he um, can't ask the question. His mic is not working. So let me ask it for him. Um, the question is really one about comparative research. You've given us a sense of the debates um, around um, the critiques of ethics and politics, but your, your, your material was all from the UK. Do you, do you, can you draw on studies in other countries? How is this debate looking um, um, if from the US perspective? Which I think would be interesting, and perhaps also, um, you know, across across other countries, indeed. Yeah, uh, that's that's a really good question. Actually, um, there's a um, couple of studies um, that I can think of. So, um, one study is conducted um, in China and looking at um, like Indian students studying in like less lesser known um, Chinese universities, and actually um um this um this um it's it's actually by um Pei Dong Yang and this um he actually analyzed the relationship between um like higher education institutions individual students and their families and um educational intermediary intermediary like like brokers so and then how they are um like how they kind of like the logic of the, how their um, like relationship actually worked to produce unusual um, pattern of international mobility, which is which is you know which should be like happening, you know, like which which um, is largely linked to the capital accumulation and social reproduction, but this is actually. You know they are all compl com complicit in this kind of um, process. So I can say that these kind of studies are happening in the context of China. Um, that's what I can think of, but I'm not really too sure. Um, like, yeah, I think that's the uh, study that I can think of at the moment. That's fine. No, I think that Pedro's work is great. Huh? Who's my student? Um, but I, I do think that um, you're, you, you're, you said something about being complicit, and I thought it was interesting. My initial reaction was, well, hang on, you know, is it is it as simple as that? But of course, many students are quite concerned to ensure their reputation of the institutions they're in is is sustained because that's going to sustain their own scholarly um, um, brand as well. So, so there is this sort of difficult situation where you are caught in in, in having to, to 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 sort of often buy. At great expense in education that you then have to defend in order to sort of support your future. Yep. Let me go on to um Su Yung Li. Su Yung Li. Su Yung, come come in, please. Um thank you, David. And thank you, Dr. Lee, for your presentation. So my question is about um student agency, because you use this framework of board use habitus. And I was wondering your thoughts and findings about student agency, what their role is, because you started your presentation um, by mentioning the deficit models on deficit perspectives on students. And if we focus on the institutional habits, 
too much. I don't know. And then the implications that you concluded with just like that as an example, maybe um, the role of higher education institutions and policymakers, they are highlighted. But what about student role? And yeah, I also have a second question if the time allows. And I also okay. wondered your, your next research project out of this project, because it was quite a big project that comparative research. And what about the next project that you're working on related to this project? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, that's a good question too. So um, yeah, so the role of students, well, um, I, I actually, this this notion of institutional habits is um i that's actually one of the strengths of this um concept is to highlight the interplay of institution in institutional and institution as well as um individual students so um for instance like the last example that i gave um in terms of post study um aspiration and transition there's this student who who is who actually um rely on student loans to come to study in the UK but you know in normal circumstances you know she could have just um you know return or like having very limited choice after graduation but through this kind of um you know through like while studying in at Oxford and being exposed to lots of resources provided by the university she was able to imagine like much like much more opportunities than um than otherwise so so this kind of thing um this kind of example illustrates that students does uh, like student does have like agency um to overcome this kind of like structural like factors i would say so yeah i think i hope that would answer the que question and this institutional habits is, um yeah really highlight uh, not just not just about the institutional context which shape um this experience of international students but also um these this kind of um interaction or interplay between individual institutions and international students so yeah hope that answers your question and about the second question um next project wow <laughs> well i haven't well i have lots of ideas and i actually um I actually submit a lot of proposals on uh, building on my doctoral um, project, but I got rejected many times. But I would like to look at, I don't know, like um, if I have the opportunity, perhaps I would look at um, um, like student international students experience in like, um, like, um, how can I say like a less um, popular and like located in rural areas, like so, so that um, whether like their experience, like the extent to which their experience is different are different from those that I have already looked at from my doctoral thesis, because still um, um, Oxford, UCL, Oxford Brooks are located in, in two um, expensive cities in the UK, in England, and and yeah there are some that's actually one of the limitations of my research so yeah that's about it <laughs> yeah great thank you um Su-Yung and Jihun. so one of the things that occurs to me also about this research and um I was involved in a in the um preparing a report on academic mobility for the UNESCO conference on world higher education last year was that you know inevitably we need to think and institutions need to think quite hard about how they're sustaining ever ever larger inequalities within the sector by by promoting physical mobility and one of the recommendations of the report we were involved in was suggesting a, a more hybrid model of of mobility which would of course address the, the big ethical elephant of the room which is climate crisis and um and and the ways in which um the ever growing numbers of student mobility the six million um you know the sort of even though only two percent of all students are are internationally mobile, but that number is still growing. And if it's six million, that, that's an awful lot of flights. Do you sense any any um awareness or sort of interest in in, in models of, of of higher education that would, would be more um hybrid? Or do you think that the students are very much the price and the promise is one of being in the institution itself? It is the physicality of the habitus. 
Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think so. I think I personally think that hybrid mo model can work only if, um, well, for instance, like transnational education, like um, UK transnational um, education is a good example. So many UK UK university have like their branch campus in like lots of like Asian countries, right? Or in, in like Middle East and so on. But uh, there, the students experience, um, the quality of education there is um, being reported um, of, reported to be not as the, not as good as good quality as the one that um, students receive in the UK. And I think in order to, in order to um, make this hybrid model or um, this kind of like t &E work, I think it's really important to um, provide like at least equivalent um, resources, like for instance, like staff or actual like learning materials um, equivalent to the quality that you can get in the UK, for instance, mm -hmm. then I think that could work. And yeah, that's actually um, like uh, my another second project idea, actually. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So th mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that's, um, yeah. Balancing between the two, I think it's really important. Because Brooks does offer a huge number of distance learning degrees. And I think it would be interesting to reflect on how students experiencing the different types of, of learning yeah. saw, saw the ethics of what they were doing in relationship to the price they were paying. I, I, we've got yeah. some more questions. So I'm going to go now to Neil. Um, Neil, um, it's yours. The floor's yours. Sorry, Neil, can you unmute first, please? It's it's still not unmuting. Can you have another go? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Right. right, sorry about that. Um, right, um, here's my question. Uh, to what extent has recent international political turbulence impacted the flow of international, especially Chinese students to the United Kingdom. And we know we know what I'm really talking about here in terms of China and the rest of the world, but also other countries as well. Um, well, thank you for the question. Um, well, it does really play a role, I think, um, based on data, like, but but at the same time, I think that's where, um, like, the, the complexity of international student mobility is really seen, being seen, because um, despite this kind of, well, I think, well, at least in, I think during this COVID-19, still there are a lot of high, um, Chinese students um, apply for, like, UK to study. But I think this kind of geopolitical, um, like the, this kind of impact is, is much more higher in the U US context where, you know, this kind of um, trade word does actually fit into the number of um, Chinese students enrolled in US, US higher education. So I think, um, yeah, it, it need, like the you know, future of the, the, the full, full, um, future flow of international student to the UK um, remain to be seen, but I think um, compared to the US, I think UK is doing pretty well, I think. Hope that answered your question. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's, in, it's interesting, yes, how, it's it's interesting how, how robust it is. So a, a question for um, you from David Law, who's on a train and can't speak. You did mention academic imperialism at one point. Um, and um, he'd like you to know more about what you meant by that. Well, academic imperialism is um, basically the degree, um, like UK degree, like based on this kind of colonial history is valued um, more, like not just like culturally, emotionally and economically. So as I have demonstrated in my presentation, there are, um, there are more, uh, there are like a couple of um, students mentioned about how um, this kind of UK degree is 
is worth. Um, yeah, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. It's like about these kind of um, um, their their perception of their uh, the UK degree as an academic degree, um, is basically um, embedded in this kind of um historical, like like a this kind of colonial history, um, because majority of of those participants were actually coming from, you know, the previous British colonies. So yeah, hope that makes sense. That makes sense for India and, and many post-training African countries, but less so for China. Well, <laughs> well, that's a good question, but yeah. Um, don't worry, that's just, I'll just leave that with you. Um, there's no, you don't, it's, it's an interesting question around, around how repetitional sort of geographies travel. Oh, oh, one more question um, for me is I, I, I'm aware, you know, and you did a very, you know, you, you're right to focus very much on the elitism of Oxford um, and the cultures that can feel like they're exclusionary, though I think people are trying quite hard, certainly in the UK context, to change our demographics. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work thinking about um, access and recruitment, but but it's often very domestic. And so one, one person famously said, well, you know, how do we prioritise um, Grimsby or Guatemala? You know, it, how do you prioritise um, widening access and participation from within the UK or from around the world, and you know how, how would you measure that? How would you measure? How would you measure that? So, do you think? Do you think one of the challenges here, in terms of the ethics of international recruitment, is is finding a way of of assessing very different students and very different backgrounds, and how you might sort of make uh, allocate um, a, a sort of sense of equity and justice in that admissions process? Um, yeah, that's really really good question. Which requires me to um, think a lot, I guess. But um, um, yeah, um, I think <clears throat> one of the first, um, like, first thing, first way to, um, I think, widening participation for international students is a good idea, definitely. But in terms of how, well, I think the first step could be. Um, like at least um, put some regulation of like tuition fees mm -hmm. um, for international students. I think that could be really a good, like easier way uh, to start with, I guess, because currently it's un like unregulated, like in many other Western countries, but instead of collecting all the data, like which is quite uh, require a lot of resources for uni from universities or other um, higher education, you know, stakeholders. But I think at least putting some regulation of tuition fees could um, allow international students from, like, I wouldn't say poor, but like low income backgrounds, at least to give a thought and try applying. Try, try submitting applications to UK universities and hopefully they got it, <laughs> get it. But yeah, I think that could be, you know, good, perhaps, I don't know, good way to start. I think, I think you're right. It would be, it, it, that would be a, um, a turn up for the books in, in, in our very deregulated higher education sector to start, to start trying to, um, I mean, it seems to me as if the government is, is, is um, totally contradictory in its, in its policy environment around, wanting universities to um to, to um restrict international student numbers on the other hand not not supporting them and thinking about how they might how they might do that in a way that allows them to keep afloat given the other finding constraints on them um june you've given us some really interesting thoughts today and um I, it, your research is is really exciting I, I wish you the very best for for what comes next for you um i'd like to thank everyone who's come today um, it's been very, very useful and interesting. If there's no other questions, um, we will um, wrap up a little bit early and um, this will be posted tomorrow. Do, could, do come and join us um, next Tuesday for our, our next webinar and um, look forward to seeing you very soon. The, the next week's webinar is entitled Traditional Knowledge is Global Resource. So Tuesday, 2 p.m., Thursday, 2 p.m. And thanks again for coming, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jihun. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.